I would like to introduce Max Frischknecht. He is a design researcher, programmer, and graphic designer, currently a PhD student in digital humanities at the University of Bern, and part of the research project Participatory Knowledge Practices in Analog and Digital Image Archives. In his talk, uh, he will investigate how visualizations and interfaces in digital cultural collections support participatory use. I leave the floor to Max Frischknecht. Thank you, Vera. Can you see the presentation and hear me well? Perfect. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to my presentation. I hope you are having a great time in Rome. As Vera already said, I'm Max. I have a background in design and web development. And since this February, I'm a PhD student in digital humanities at the University of Bern. I would like to give you a quick overview on my talk. So I would like to firstly introduce the PIA project, which some of you are probably familiar with, but for those who don't know a bit of context where this, the research of me, but also of Julia takes place. Then I would like to talk about the role of participation in our project and then present to you the model which we are currently using to address the needs of the users of this interface which we are planning to develop. So hopefully I can um, bring something to the discussion which we also had at the end of the last talk. And then last but not least, a quick summary and outlook how we will proceed. So first, the PIA. PIA stands for Participatory Knowledge Practices in Analog and Digital Image Archives, or short PIA. It's a Synergia project that is funded by the Swiss National Science Foundation, and it runs from February 2021 till January 2025. So you see, we started very recently. It's a collaboration between the Swiss Society of Folklore Studies, SGV, which will provide three collections to work with, the Seminar for Cultural Studies and European Ethnology at the University of Basel, which has close ties to the SGV, then the Digital Humanities Lab and the Databases and Information Systems from the University of Basel, which will be responsible for the technical development. So uh, Julien will tell you more about this. And then the Institute of Design Research and the Digital Humanities of Bern, as well as Astrom Zimmer and Tereskiewicz, which is a design studio based in Zurich that will help us to develop the final design solution. The project has two broad aims. First, the systematic analysis and description of the analog and digital photo archives. This will be done on the example of these three collections provided by the SGV. I will briefly introduce them to you in a minute. And secondly, the design and development of a participatory image archive, which will also be done on the example of these three collections. Although the overall aim is that our results at the end are also adaptable to auto collections. To have, give you a quick overview that you have an idea with what material we are working, I will very briefly introduce these three collections to you. So the first one is the collection by Ernst Brunner. He was a professional photographer active between 1936 and 1979, who mostly took documentary photographs on a wide range of folkloric themes in Switzerland. It's the largest of the three collections consisting of 50,000 um, negatives. Excuse me, I just got a um, message that you only see my first slide. Is that correct? And um, that shouldn't be the idea.
I try again to share my presentation. So it seems to look better now. Do you see the slides? Okay, perfect. So you didn't miss any really important slides so far. Okay, as I said, this is the first uh, collection of Ernst Brunner who uh, mostly took documentary photographs on a wide range of folkloric themes in Switzerland. And it's the biggest of the three collections. The second collection is by the family Kreis. It consists of material that ranges from 1860 to 1970, so more than 100 years, and consists of 16,000 photographic objects, mainly photo albums, that are interesting because they show how this family self positions themselves in a bourgeoisie society in Basel, but also because of the long time span you can trace the transformation of the medium of photography over time. Now, the last of the three collections the PIA project will work with is the Atlas for Swiss Folklore. It was a research project that was carried out by the Swiss Society of Folklore between 1930 and 1940 and was published until recently as a collection of maps that show cultural patterns in Switzerland, like everyday behavior, local law, celebrations, festivals, and more. It paints a very distinct image of Switzerland's folk culture at that time. And what is interesting, next to the maps, which are very nicely drawn, there is a lot of research material about the interview logs, answer sheets, photographic prints, drawings, which haven't been available to the public yet, and as we hope, also show how these maps have been constructed. Now that you know a bit about the context of the project, I would like now to address the role of participation, which is one of the goals of this project. And for this, I would like to give a very, very brief discussion about participation and why we consider it important. So as many of you know, since the beginning of the 21st century, many Swiss archives and collections have been steadily digitizing their materials. And while the analog archives are concerned with the long-term preservation, the digital archives aim at making these holdings accessible to the public. This also is true for the SKV, which digitized roughly 100,000 photographs since 2018, which are available online in open access format. Many argue that these digital collections increase the level of access and that this will facilitate further research from academics as well as lay persons. Contrary, others also argue that the first years of experience showed that digital availability alone does not lead to a broader use of and work on research collections. So it seems that this participation seems not to be a self-explanatory fact. But why should we consider participation an important aspect in the first place? For me, because at least in theory, the decision-making power of the archives over the formation of history can be democratized. In a globalized, fast-paced world, I consider this important because the collections we are currently working with paint a very uniform picture of Switzerland. They therefore, in a way, set a point of contrast to the multicultural Switzerland of today. Large parts of Today's Swiss society are not part of this archive and participation could help to manifest these perspectives 
in these archives. But for this that we can achieve it, I believe it is important to really understand the user's perspective, his motivations, as well as the activities, tasks, and technical operations that are involved in this process of participation. This leads me to two questions. How can a visual interface or a visualization support participation in archival tasks? And how can participants change the established archive-based narratives? For this, I would like to show you now the model we are currently using to find out, um, basically to define the requirements for the design, but also for the technical uh, development of this archive to, to enable participation. For this, as a starting point, we chose the activity centered design model, which was first introduced by Don Norman and later adopted by Cooper et al. We adopted this uh, model for our specific issues for digital participation, which I would like to present to you now. We chose this activity centered design model because traditionally in design, most models, for example, the human centered design, focus on tasks. So the center of attention is what is necessary to achieve a certain task. Now, the critique towards this um, approach is that this will ignore the context in which these tasks happen. And this is where the activity centered design model comes in. As we adopted it, it currently consists of four stages. So it asks first the questions, what are the goals and what are the motivations to participate? From there, it leads to the activity. So what activity results out of this motivation? This activity goes further and differentiates in different tasks that tell how is this participation carried out. And last but not least, it leads us to action and operations by which means are these tasks solved. I would like to now go quickly through them and introduce uh, some examples that it becomes more concrete. So the first part of this model, the goals and motivations we addressed with a series of interviews with uh, users of the um, image archive of the SKV, but also with database experts. We are still in the process of that. So we are still carrying out interviews, but some motivations we could identify very global are that people can share their knowledge with the archive, but also with others and that people can engage with their cultural identity and history. And here it was interesting to see that people have very specific topics where they want to engage with, for example, um, a, a certain fashion style or a cer certain place because they had relatives there at a certain time. And, how, and the, the participants get a, change, a chance to change these established archive-based narratives. Now, the second part, the activities we also addressed with a series of interviews, but also with a analysis of existing digital heritage collections that have some kind of participation built in. And so far we could identify four different modes of participations. Some are very familiar, I guess, to you, for example, crowdsourcing. Others like physical access are a newer phenomenon where you use the web kind of as a preparation, for example, to build your personalized tour through a museum. Community co-creating and last but not least, co-curating and co-collecting, which is a mode I would like now to um, discuss a bit in detail with you because we think it's a very interesting one. So I would like to show you an example where the activity of co-curating is built in in the interface. So this example, Silk Memory, is a website that documents uh, the history of silk, silk uh, textile printing in Zurich, and it enables the user to participate through this activity that we call co-creating or co-curating, because the users here they can create stories. So they can create a subset sub-collection out of all the material 
chosen on a topic of, of their interest and describe it. And this kind of serves as an access point for themselves, for their own research, because they can save this collection, but also as an access point to others who are interested in that and therefore kind of provides an insight into the collection that comes from people outside of the archive. Now, in order to achieve this, there are, and now we go a level deeper in this methodology, the task. So the people, in order to make this activity of creating a story, their individual access point, they need to do two, mainly two things. They need to cluster. So they need to group similar objects and create their own sub collection out of it. And they need to create a narration. So they need to add the objects into a story and choose a sequence. To show you how this is done in the example, this is a story, for example, that shows uh, improvements in digital printing in silk. And on the left side, you basically see a collection of, of materials that the person clustered together. And on the right side, you see the texts that the person wrote uh, to contextualize this collection and to, to argue why this is an interesting field. And an interesting detail is that maybe you see on the right side, there are these very little dots in the text. These are direct links to the selection of these uh, materials. So you can click on one and it directly opens um, the respective textile pattern. This now to enable this task, so narration and clustering, we go again a level deeper in this method, which brings us to the actions and operations, which um, now becomes fairly te technical, but it gives you a, a very clear understanding on a design side, which functionalities does your interface need, but also on a technical side. For those who are familiar with software development, you can basically create a backlog out of this requirement list and prioritize them uh, in order to, to start your development process. This is mainly basic and very clear, but of course you need to orientate yourself. So you need to show, you uh, need to create a visual access to the collection. People need to be able to search and filter. They need to be able to see details on demand. They need to be able to relate how do different items uh, stay in relation to each other. They need to be able to select, write, probably reposition, save, and publish, which are probably two different steps. Not necessary, but they need to export also. This uh, example does makes this possible. You can download your, your, your personal collection as a CSV or PDF. And last but not least, you probably need to constantly be able to edit all of these uh, aspects in order to develop your question further. I would li like now to quickly summarize what um, this model, how it, how it helped us and, and where we are going there from now. So, as I said, we carried out, a, where we're still in the process, but we carried out uh, interviews um, to address mainly the first, first two goals and activities and an analysis of examples to address the tasks and actions and operations. So on the example of existing databases. And this helps us in two ways. So the first two, by understanding the goals and also the expectation that the people have towards an interface, it helps us now to go, and this is where we are now in the project, in a concept phase where we develop concepts and scenarios on how this interface could look, how is the user journey. And these concepts will then be um, evaluated in a next step in a workshop in September this year. This is kind of the, the, the one side and the other side is the more technical one that these tasks and operations, they give us a very clear overview over what everything which parts need to be designed at some point in the future and which parts need to be technically developed, at least in the front end, in some part in the future to enable this. 
So this is where I would like to conclude. And I thank you for your attention. I'm interested in your thoughts and because we already tackled this topic of who is the user. And um, yes, I'm looking forward to a nice discussion afterwards and leave the floor now to Julia. Thank you. So oh, thank you very much. Uh just um, add a short introduction um, about Julia. Um, after studying and teaching information science at the University of Applied Science in Geneva and bookseller by trade, he is currently a PhD student in digital humanities at the University of Basel. And um, he is part of the same research project that we just heard about. Um, but in his presentation, he um, will take the opportunity to show, to show us another perspective, um, namely the opportunity to present the data um, and interoperability model of the project currently in the conceptualizing phase. So thank you very much, Julia. Thank you. Uh, so hi, everyone. Thank you very much, Vera, for the introduction. And also thank you, Max, for uh, your presentation about PIA, so my presentation can go actually quite faster <laughs> and we'll have more time to talk. Um, so today I'm going to present how the implementation of APIs, namely the TripLife APIs within the PR project will impact the architecture data mo model. So be roughly divided into five parts. And actually maybe peculiar, but I will actually start by the most important points. Uh, if you can just read that one and after you don't really need to follow the presentation. But first of all, IIIF is much more than the Zoom and PAN uh, capabilities. I mean, it is nice, nice for end users, but if you stop at this, you haven't really understood why IIIF was important because it can play a central part in how cultural heritage objects can be disseminated and reused. Um, it's really one of the biggest advantages advantage of IIIF is that you can streamline the uh, data workflow. And I would like also to take the opportunity to say that a triple F like approach. So these open APIs or open standards that are based on the architecture of the web, um, which are basically more linked to open usable data, um, community driven initiatives, maybe like this one that we are doing today. And that should be universally established when handling data. So a few inspiration. Um, first example that I would like to mention is the is from the Victoria Now that Museum that has released their second version of the APIs about two months ago. Uh, what is really interesting here is not only that the APIs, but the great documentation and example that they have done as well. Uh, very serious example, but very silly ones as what is in their collection. And I think that's also um, I mean, it's great to just expose your model, but if you don't document it, if you don't give examples, blog post, presentation, if you do, do all the digitization work and the data model for nothing, I think it's too bad because it's money that was not well spent. Another great example uh, that was also released actually this year, uh, maybe three months ago, comes from the Art Institute of Chicago. They have one central API where they explain all the different APIs that they use and pretty much like the VA, they also provide IIIF endpoints and they have created tools around it. Uh, for instance, um, there is this Chrome uh, tool. So each time I open a new tab, I have a new image from the Art Institute of Chicago that you can download directly as IIIF image or you can click on it and see more information about it. And I think this is just brilliant. I mean, if everything is open, then you can enable different tools to be built around it. And now each day I'm presented with something new. And the Getty Museum has implemented TripF as well in different projects. This is uh, one of them, such as the 12 Sunsets, which is an interactive website exploring 12 years of head versus photos of Sunset Boulevard. And so what he did is that he put on his truck and take, took a picture of every, I don't know, every maybe one meter or so. And they, with the geographic information data, you can actually see now how it looked in 2017, et cetera, so in 12 different states. 
So was it so everything is through Pi interoperable? But also you have the hierarchical information display as well if you're more interested. Um, so basically what Tobias said in his uh, previous talk so here you see the hierarchy and where it was taken. And also if you want to view a triple manifests manifest um, with the range sequence of images. So speaking of which, uh, this may go fast. If you don't know about it, we can talk about it later also. But what is TripIF? So it stands for International Image Interoperability Framework. That's why we always say triple IF. And broadly speaking, it is a, an open standard uh, model for delivering many types of image-based resources. We say image-based because first of all, it was for images, but now you can also disseminate audio and video resources and in many different formats and audiences can interact with them. Um, so it provides a lot of benefits to the institutions that use these APIs. But TripIF is more than a standard. And actually, I think this is the main point is that it is a global open community uh, of range of different people, software developers, librarians, researchers, educators, museum, university, you name it, that work together to develop these APIs in transparent manner, um, and then they have to implement them in software. So either they create new ones or they customize them, and then you can expose those content more easily. So they're really trying to solve problems together uh, because sharing images on the web has historically been quite complicated and much work is needed to effectively share and work with them. Uh, most um, infrastructure can be hard and expensive to develop and especially to maintain. Uh, the image delivery can be very slow and overall a very disjointed experience for end users. So they know how to work with one interface and then when they go to another one, they have to relearn actually how to do it. Uh, so, and even if images are made openly accessible to all, we often find they still live in silos. And not only silos as one institution has one silo and the other one often different projects within big institutions have their own silos. I can't remember the exact number of the British Library. They had maybe more than 20 different viewers for their digitization projects before they implemented IIIF. So can you imagine the hurdle of just maintaining all that infrastructure and data? The full power of IIIF really comes into effect across institutions. Uh, that's why we call, I mean, they are like de facto standard for delivering images, but they're really APIs, open APIs. And the kind of things you can do is really searching across repositories, maybe seeing another institution's annotations about digital objects, or opening an institution image in a separate, separate TruePath compli compliance application. I mean, you can, if you know that how TruePath works, you don't need to stay in the same workspace, you can just go somewhere else. There are two core APIs, um, the TripIF and Image API, um, one that deliver the pixel and the other one, um, the presentation about the objects, uh, basic metadata. It's not, you don't need to be very verbose about what you want to, 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 to convey in your uh, manifest. Um, it's really more about the viewing experience and the structure. The TripIF Image API can be called in two different ways. Uh, so here you can see the, the syntax. You can either request an image, so the, the really want to see the content, which derived from the underlying image uh, content that is available in terms of resolution, format, and also request information about the image service. Um, so their functionality, the re related service that is uh, offered by the image server. And this information is provided through the info.json. So these metadata uh, can be read then by different application in this manner. The image, uh, so what is visible on this slide about the image API, so it's showing that it's just a URL that delivers the whole image or parts of an image in different resolutions. So you see the image API is producing a detailed version of an image in different sizes, flipped, rotated, and finally in grayscale. And that seemed maybe not very important, but what is great is that once you have uh, implemented IIIF, you can 
have these amazing deep stack, uh, zoom and pan, but most website, they often want to show images in different places. They have some showcases, maybe on the home page, they have uh, just thumbnails and every, every thing, I mean, every image can just be a thumbnail. You just, you don't need to generate again, these images. Um, the, the basic viewer for triple F is just an HTML tag that just say embed this image at this point in this quality. So that's one of the benefits as well, is that you don't need to replicate your images all times. And we, when we're thinking about consumption and the climate change, that's something that we need to take into account. And the presentation API is based on the um, abstract level that is called the shared canvas data model, uh, which is um, also, and it also compliant with the web annotation da data model, uh, which used to be the open annotations. So the basically the same thing, they just, now they are W3C approved. Um, but so the content is actually painted or annotated onto a canvas. So you give, you give it a size. And then if you have transcription, you put the X, I, Y, age coordinates, as well as annotation and so on. And you can also think about the construction of an image from different content coming together to one uh, same abstract space. Different resources types um, is defined in data model. They are the main ones. So you have the content, which can be an image, text, audio, video, and maybe soon 3D. I mean, 3D can work with Tripaf, but with some, um, you don't cheat, but there is like a, a way to go around it if you want to work with 3D and Tripaf. But there is a group that works about, um, about implementing the, that in a more standard way. Um, and then the canvas, and as we saw in the previous slides, the, um, the content is annotated onto canvases. You will need range as soon as we have more than one canvas. Uh, if, you want, if your digital object has X images uh, or X audio files, then you would need that range information. The range is also about the table of content. So that's also um, a type of resource type that is used in different ways. And then what is really important in Tree by parlance is the manifest, which really represents the digital objects. So these manifests contain one or more sequence. So these ranges uh, of canvases and along with other metadata. So uh, mostly legal and structured metadata in JSON, but a little bit of descriptive metadata as well. Um, you can work with any kind of, um, I mean, metadata standards. It's just key pair values in JSON. So it's up to you how you want your metadata to be delivered. And finally, manifest can be referenced in, uh, from collection, which is a recursive structure. So you can have collections of collections and collection of collections. And you can go on and on. Uh, you can even have users have their own collection. So they can be user generated as well. It doesn't have to be uh, like for a PR project, the Brunner collection, and then you have or uh, its picture or the picture ranging from year and year. It can be absolutely, um, I mean, as the researcher wants it or in the, in the user wants it. And that's the full detail model. I'm not going to talk about it longer, but there is also what is called the annotation collection. That's quite important if you want to do annotation across repositories. Basically in an image viewer, so here is Mirador, uh, the image API, uh, yeah, it's the, really the image data and the presentation API is actually the, so the strip of thumbnails, the descriptive metadata, uh, as well as the table of content. So there are other APIs as table, uh, such as the authentication and content search API, still in version one, but they're going to be upgraded. And as well, the change discovery API, I don't have time to talk about that today. So PR, I'm not really, going to repeat what um, Max said. So yes, we are a four-year project, but what is really important is within these two goals to design a, a visual interface with um, as well the crowdsourcing the machine learning based tools uh, to make it easily to annotate, contextualize, organize, and link both image and their metadata. Of course, Drupal can play a major role and not only in delivery of images, but also how we want to integrate these information with a different type of um, functionalities that we want to, to implement. So here are different 
stakeholders that Max mentioned and the three different collection. So if you go actually to the uh, to this address, so the archive SQ file SSTP, then you will have access to what is actually digitized. And we will concentrate on these three collections, but of course, maybe the data model will be also thought of not only letting the other um, uh, collection just disappear from the model, we have, need to take consideration of what is available there. So, and in terms of um, from the Atlas, the Christ, the Brunner collections, they're very different in terms of how we want to present them to the, the, um, the end user. I mean, they, if they have all enough structured metadata, each photo can be actually a triple F manifest. But when I also think about uh, for the, the, the Brunner collection, really in terms of reportage uh, and in terms of the, 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 the Christ family, we can think about a year or vacation somewhere or the album actually in terms of physical constraints. And for the more, most complex one, the Atlas, which is not yet digitized, then you, you can see or imagine that there's a lot of geographical information that take place into what was surveyed. Um, or here the example is bread. So what kind of bread breads did you make? So surveys in the 30s and 40s. Uh, some information, more information here. The website is in, under construction, but we have a so-called documentation uh, that and bank. So maybe you 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 can have some information here. It's more internally, but actually it's quite, I mean, some useful information and resources. We also on research gates, and most importantly for the rest of this talk, GitHub. So, all right, I just have five minutes. I need to rush a bit. So here's the current SQL ontology. I know it's quite small, but what is important is that it has eight different types. Uh, it's, it was actually, um, it's done in terms of the SQL image. So the image is really the, the central part as well as the, um, the collection, but there are also other types of, of materials such as film or these ton build chow. And we don't really have that in, 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 in the PR collection but we need to take into account that. And there is some linking to geonames for the places that we knew about. So that's the current ontology. And this is the future of PR data model. As you can see, it's quite um, conceptual, but basically I have a few leads. Uh, we want to reuse at least the dubbing call terms that exist from the current SQFR ontology before the dedicated or very, I mean, Ones that were just created for SK file in terms of interoperability, we have to decide what to do with those. I uh, either find uh, different vocabularies or um, ontologies. And also, um, I think I'm very interested in the work of what Linked Art is doing. It's based on Cydox CRM, but it's not as verbose. It's really the more pragmatical way of Linked Art, and it can be easily linked to other kind of vocabularies. Uh, I Maybe the, I'm very interested by Tobias' talk about the process uh, creation for the records in context. That would be something that's quite, quite interesting for us. And there is some reconciliation and external linking to do. Um, so we have geonames, but Swiss Turbo now has opened their, their platform with open data. And the, the reconciliation could also be done with Swiss Turbo when we have more um, information. I think that's a great platform to use. In terms of person, institution, um, these authoritative data like Gende in Germany or, or Wikidata could be interesting. And also in terms of the subject or keywords, maybe they could be linked to art and architecture thesaurus or other thesaurus as well, you should see. Icon class, it's still a question mark. So in terms of triple resource mapping, uh, the two most important thing is what is the manifest for us? Is it just a picture? Is it a reportage? The album can be all of them. I mean, it doesn't have to be that one picture when it is in its own manifest can also be in another manifest. The, the, the question is really how do we deal with those new identifiers? And then the range, how do we want to structure that? So here's just an example. So I used CP, which is a server from um, that was developed by the Digital Humanities Lab, but now maintained by the Dash in Basel. So I created uh, by hand, never did do that. 
<laughs> but this manifests in JSON. And uh, it is to display how the Schweizer Fastnacht from uh, Ernst Brunner was actually eight different pictures could be rendered in Mirador. So just showcasing that actually a reportage in terms of manifest could work. Here, a lot of things. If we wanted to implement all the APIs, that would be actually very complex. But what is really important actually in this picture, in this diagram, is as soon as we have the image and presentation APIs available, how do you want that to make, uh, how do, do we want to make annotation? So here is another diagram that is eh, not that um, great. But basically, there are three points important. First, the image delivery. So that's uh, on the left. And second thing is when we have user input in terms of crowdsourcing participation, how do we want these images to be uploaded? And also we want to use uh, Vitriva for image similarity. Uh, so that's a machine learning tool that is used by the, um, uh, the University of Basel. So these three things are the main focus of Drupal. I don't have time to do that. That's the most important point. Uh, like the Art Institute of Chicago or the VNA, it'd be great to have good documentation about our APIs because maybe we don't have time in these four years, even if it is a lot to do everything. But if we expose those contents and really explain how it works and document them, other researchers can actually make use of that. And maybe also answering questions that we didn't even think of. Uh, so the triple API endpoints would be one thing. Uh, basic metadata, I think it's still important to reuse what is currently available. Technical metadata, we never know. I mean, some art historians may be very interested in, in what kind of ICC profile uh, um, picture uh, they are, the more structured ones. And also that's the, the maybe the most difficult ones to, to deal with is annotation. How do we maintain them? Uh, do we want them? Because Max mentioned the edit part, which is not that easy, and which who is the authority authority to actually say that this is an annotation to be displayed in this and this viewer? So, some references if you want to read. And now we come to the discussion. Thank you very much for that.